Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. I hope you're having a great day. Well, this weekend has seen a dramatic rise in tensions in the pro-Hamas protester community across Canada. Or should I say, the pro-Marxist agitator community across Canada. These have included demonstrations in Vancouver, where protesters have glorified the horrific events of October 7th in Israel, where over a thousand innocent people including infants, were raped, tortured, and brutally slaughtered. We demand a free Palestine from the river to the sea! And that we stand with the Palestinian resistance and their heroic and brave action on October 7th! And they said, long live October 7th! And we say today, long live October 7th! So who's really behind these protests and what are their goals? I think the answer will shock you. Stick around to the end and find out. Glorifying the brutality of October 7th is a horrific display of callousness. It's possible to both be equally disturbed by the horrors of war and the suffering of innocent people and children, but also be horrified by what happened on October the 7th in Israel. Taking the side of the Hamas attackers of October the 7th well, quite frankly, that's sick. And the fact that the police are doing very little, well, that's distressing to say the least. But I know it's not their call, it's not the call of the police. I know that they are being driven by political forces, by the mayors, by the provincial premiers, and probably even by the federal government. And make no mistake, it's the politicians that don't have the testicular fortitude to do anything about this. But the longer these politicians sit on their hands and do nothing, the more likely it is that these demonstrations will escalate, possibly even to a full-on war. And no, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. So let's be clear. There's a good number of these pro-Hamas, well, pro-terrorists, protesters, that have no real skin in the game except that they are professional Marxist agitators, and they are being paid to stir up hatred. They're trying, quite frankly, to get as many people as they can to jump on the bandwagon. Take this protest in Vancouver, where the woman with the megaphone is praising the October 7th attacks. You can tell by her accent that she was most likely raised in Canada. And what about Deanna Sheriff? who was arrested in Ottawa this week for incidents that occurred last week. These agitators jump on any cause they can and take any opportunity they can to stir things up and call for revolution. This is right out of Marx's Communist Manifesto. Rile people up, get them divided and fighting each other. Divide and conquer. But who's behind all of this? Have you noticed that the protesters occupying American university campuses and now campuses in Canada are very well organized. Many people have noticed that the encampments at Columbia University even have matching high-end tents. Well, it's been determined that George Soros and the Rockefeller brothers have been funding student-led protests in the United States. And I have no doubt that they are also funding protests in Canada and elsewhere around the world. Watch this report from the New York Post. If I could only stop at old, rich and opinionated, I would put it away. But he's old, rich, opinionated and dangerous. So I get a lot of questions about who's behind these protests, who's funding the protesters, is there funding, are some of the protesters being paid? And the answer to that is yes, they are being paid. Um, there's a lot of levels of obfuscation though, and for an investigative reporter it's a real workout because a lot of groups like George Soros's Open Society Foundations and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund are giving donations through something called a fiscal sponsor, 
which is a, a nonprofit organization that then disperses funds to other groups. And this is how some of the groups like Students for Justice in Palestine and other groups are getting money. The big funders like the Soros Foundations and the Rockefeller Brothers Foundations are sending money through various different levels of nonprofits. So that when you go back to try to find who is the original donor, you have to do a lot of work. I noticed as well that some of the protesters that have been active in student protests have been funded through fellowships to another group that while it features the photos and the first names of the protesters on their website, they don't give last names. And it was interesting too for me that when I looked up the students themselves, uh, many of them are no longer students at the respective universities where they're, they're doing the protests and they don't have their fellowships through which they got money to be protesters essentially. They don't have that on their LinkedIn pages. So there's a level of obfuscation that's going on. There's a level of hiding um, so that you don't know who the, the original donors are. One example is the Open Society Foundation has sent maybe $20 million to a group called the Tides Foundation, which is known as a fiscal sponsor that then will disperse funds to different groups, to different, in this case, to different radical anti-Israel groups. So the, the point being is that the original donor can say, well, I gave to the Tides Foundation uh, on a tax receipt if they did want to hide it. So you might ask why George Soros and the Rockefeller Fund brothers would be funding all of these protests. What's in it for them? We could also go back to 2020 and 2021 with all of those protests and ask the same thing. What's in it for them? I believe at their core, they are Marxists. Now, I know that might sound like a conspiracy theory, but... We've seen this happen for a number of years now. It's also been documented that they're behind a lot of the migration crisis that countries in Europe and probably even Canada and the United States have been experiencing over the past couple of years. I think it's clear that they hate the West and Western culture and that they want to destabilize the West. And I think that would make it easier for them and the WEF just to take over. So as we found out between 2020 and 2023, the difference between truth and conspiracy theory is around six months to two years. So will this prove to be the case? Hard to say. If you've been paying attention, I think it's clear that things are coming to a head. And if we're not careful, we'll lose everything. And It'll be taken from us in the name of security. But that's just my opinion. I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to smash that like button. Share this out to your friends. And if you haven't already, please smash that subscribe button. It really helps the channel out. And we'll see you on the next video.